Well, good morning, church. No, that's not going to work. I'm just going to go ahead and tell you all right now. Uh, good morning, church. Uh, look at somebody beside you right now and say, I am so glad you're sitting by me. Would you tell them that right now? Somebody in the house needs to know that. And by the way, if you're sitting by somebody and they didn't tell you that, you're welcome to move right now, okay? You're welcome to get up and go sit by someone else who has a smile on their face. Well, my name is Ryan. It is so awesome to be with you guys this morning. I had the honor and the privilege to be with your students Friday night and all day yesterday. And God is at work. God is doing a powerful movement, might I dare say. Yeah, we can clap for that, by the way. Um, not, God, God is on the move, not, not just in Asbury, Kentucky, but right here in Flower Mound, Texas. We saw God stirring hearts, calling students out, uh, students repenting of sin, confessing sin, coming clean, taking a step of faith into a relationship with Jesus Christ. Last night, we saw, I don't know, a dozen or so students say, hey, I believe God's calling me into full-time ministry. And they just took a step and said, I don't know what that looks like, but I'm putting my yes on the table. And church, I'm telling you, it's a good day to be in God's house. Amen? And so thank you. Thank you for being here. I want to encourage you right now to do two simple things. Number one, I want you to get out your Bible. Um, if you brought your Bible with you, I don't care if it's paperback or electronic. Go ahead, open that thing up to Isaiah, the book of Isaiah, and we're going to jump into that passage in a moment. So number one, get out your Bible. Look at somebody beside you and say, yes, he's talking to you. Go, go ahead, tell him, would you? Uh, get, get out your Bible, open up Isaiah, and then also secondly, let me encourage you to do do something right now, whether you're watching online or whether you're in the house with us, get out something to take notes with. I don't know about you, but I always found I'm a better listener when I'm actively listening, uh, when I'm leaning in, when I'm writing stuff down. Now, I'll encourage you to take notes, not because I think I'm awesome and I've got some incredible stuff to share with you. But I want to encourage you this morning to take notes because I believe every time we open up God's word, God has something to say to us. Amen? God has something that he wants to drop in our laps. And maybe you're way smarter than I am, but there's a thousand things going on in my life. And if I don't write it down, I am prone to forget it. Anybody else in the house hold your hand about, yeah, I know, you're here. This morning, I want to continue to talk about where we were this weekend at Impact Weekend. As a matter of fact, I want to start with a story, a reminder, or a reminder of an event that happened. See, on January the 15th, 2009, Captain Chelsea Sullenberger was tasked and forced to make an impossible decision. Shortly after takeoff of his flight, you might remember, the plane was struck by a flock of geese. And in that moment, both engines being disabled, this pilot had to make a decision. Impact had happened. The engines were gone. A decision had to be made. I, I don't know about you. I'm not a pilot. I've never flown a plane. But I have flown in lots of planes. I don't know what it was like in the cockpit that day. I don't know the, the thoughts that were running through his head. I don't know the emotions that he was feeling. I don't know, but maybe... Just maybe it looked a little something like this. Mayday, mayday, mayday. This is a Cactus 1549. Hit birds. We've lost thrust on both engines. We are turning back towards the Guardia. Which engine did you lose? Both, both engines. Ignition? Ignition. Thrust levers confirm idle. Idle. Cactus 1549, if we can get a few, do you want to try to land runway 13? We are unable. We may end up in the Hudson. 
It's going to be left traffic, runway 31. Unable. Okay, what do you need to land? No relight after 30 seconds, Engine Master 1 and 2, confirm off. Too low off. terrain. Too low terrain. Too low terrain. Too low terrain. This is the captain. Brace for impact. Did you hear the words? This is the captain. What did he say? Brace for impact. This morning, church, I don't know what you walked into the room with. I don't know what valley you might find yourself in. I don't know what mountaintop you might be on. But I want to just share three words with you right now. That I hope this morning through God's word, he would equip us, he would empower us, and he would stir up our hearts to be ready. And here are the three words, church, brace for impact. Now, I haven't lived as long as some of you in the room, but I've lived longer than some of you in the room. And if you live long enough, here's what you know, life will bring you incredible highs. Amen? Anybody ever had any good highs in their life say, oh yeah, oh yeah. But life will also bring you some horrific lows. Anybody ever had some horrific lows in your life say, oh, oh yeah. And it'll bring you everything in between. And if we are not ready, if we not, are not braced, if, if we are not ready in this life, life will hit us out of nowhere. And today what I want to do is I want you to examine with me a passage where Isaiah the prophet was impacted by God, where he had this encounter with the Lord, where everything in his life shifted in a moment because of an encounter, and because of this encounter, because of this impact, because of this moment, everything was altered in his life from there on. Isaiah chapter number six, if you have your Bible, uh, go ahead and turn there, if you will. Isaiah chapter number six, if you've been in church for a while, this might be a familiar passage for you. If not, then I want you to listen close, because in Isaiah six, the Bible simply says it like this. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting upon a throne, high and lifted up, and the train of his robe filled the temple. Above him stood the seraphim. Each had six wings. I'm freaking out right now if I'm Isaiah. Anybody with me, all right? I, I, we read this kind of stuff. We're like, oh, yeah, cool. No, if you have a vision, you see the Lord, and there's six-winged creatures flying about. I don't care where you've been, what you've done. You're freaking out. Who's with me on that? Say, oh, yeah. All right, check this out. He says, above him stood seraphim. Each had six wings. With two, he covered his face. With two, he covered his feet. And with two, he flew. And one called to another. And here's what they said. Say it with me, church. Holy, I said, say it with me, church. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. Check out what he says. The whole earth is full of his glory and the foundations of the threshold shook and at the voice of him who called and, at the, and the house was, was filled with smoke and I said, say it with me, somebody loud and proud, woe is me. He's like, uh-oh. Woe is me. I am lost. I'm a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. And my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. And as if that wasn't enough, all of a sudden, one of the seraphim start flying to him. And in his hand, he had a burning coal that he had taken with tongs from the altar. And he touched my mouth and said, Behold, this has touched your lips. And listen at this phrase. Your guilt is taken away. Your sin is atoned for. And then 
I heard the voice of the Lord saying, whom shall I send? And who will go for us? Then I said, here I am. Say it with me, church. Send me. Father, I pray this morning that as we have read about the encounter, the impact that Isaiah had with you, that you had on him, the, the transformation that took place, the encounter that allowed him to never be the same, I pray this morning in this room. I pray this morning for those who are watching online. I pray right now that we would have an encounter with you. And in this moment, that you would spark a movement. In this time together, that we just simply could never be the same again. In Jesus' name, amen. Last night, I got a text from my mom at 1045. She said, are you still awake? Now, the problem was my phone was in the bathroom and it was silent. I did not see the text till I woke up this morning. I got up this morning, I checked my phone, I saw the text, and to be honest, to get a text like that from your mom at 10.45 at night is a little startling. And my only reply was, I am now. Are you okay? I know, a little late, but God is God, not me. And so she doesn't text back immediately. I'm looking over my message in my office for this morning, and then I get a text back. I'm a little bit nervous, to be honest, to read it because I don't know what's going on. I open it up, and she shares some news. One of my high school friends, son, was with another friend. They had a gun out. The gun went off accidentally shot the other boy, he went into surgery, but passed away last night. Brace for impact. How do we make it do something like that? As I sat there at my desk, a tear welled up in my eye and just began to fall down my cheek. And even though I haven't seen my friend in a long time, as a dad with children, in that moment, I couldn't imagine what he was going through. And I looked at my message and it simply said, brace for impact. Live long enough in life, I promise you, life will hit you with some incredible, awful lows. Brace for impact, though. Because life, live long enough, will also gift you with some beautiful, powerful highs. I, Isaiah, I believe in this moment, kind of experiences both of these. If you will look with me, I, I want to talk through four things that you and I need in our life if we're going to be ready for the impact that is thrown at us. If we're going to weather the storm, if we're going to walk on the mountaintop, if we're going to, in victory, give glory to God, and in the valley, give glory to God. How do we do that? Number one, write this down, please. If you and I are going to brace for impact, number one, first and foremost, write this down. You need to look up. I want you to write that down right now, no matter where you are. If you're taking notes on your phone, I have about 3,000 notes on my phone. Why? Because I'm always taking notes. I will remind you throughout this message, write this down. Why? Because if we don't write it down, we will forget it. And if we forget it, we will be surprised. We will be shaken. We will be knocked and we won't be ready for the impact. I promise you, impact is coming. 
I promise you somewhere along the way, life is going to take you by surprise. And if we are not braced, if we are not ready now, it will knock us places we don't want to go. How do we get braced for impact? Number one, we look where? Say it, church. We look up. Here's what the Bible says. In the year that King Uzziah died, say it with me loud and proud, church. I saw the Lord. If you want to be ready for impact in life, if you want to be ready for everything that life would throw at you in this day, if you want to be ready for the amazing highs and the awful lows and everything in between, the first thing that must happen is you must get a vision of God. You have to have a vision of who God is. You've got to pause and look up and realize some powerful truths about God. Look, in the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord. Where was the Lord? He was what, somebody? Sitting upon what? A throne. You know what this reminds me about God? It reminds me God is in control. See, if I can get this vision of God, not some little weak, not some little uh, 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 tender, not not some, some little fragile God, but a God that is ruling, a God that is reigning, a God is in control. If I can in my mind and in my heart solidify this truth, God is God. Boy, no matter what life throws at me, I can weather this. Not because I've got it all together. No, 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 no. Listen, listen close. But because God's got it all together. He's he's sitting on the throne. And where is he on the throne? He's high and lifted up. He's, he's, He's ruling God and he's sovereign God. Look close. He's high and he's lifted up. He's in the place of power, the place of prominence, a a position of rule and reign. And this is who God is. He is the one that is in control. You go, well, Ryan, how do you explain what took place last night? I can't explain it. And might I dare step into this and say, I don't need to try to explain it. I think sometimes we try to answer for God in ways that God never answered for himself. But if I have a right vision of who God is, if I understand how great God is and good God is and the character of God and the power of God and the preeminence of God and the sovereignty of God, man, now now we can go somewhere. So he says, I I saw the Lord. He was high and lifted up. The, The train of his robe, it filled the temple. Above him were seraphim. Above him, they all had these six wings. They covered their face, their feet, and flew. And they cried one to another. Say it with me, somebody. What? Holy, holy, holy. When you think of God, what do you think about? When you think about God, what do you think about? Do you think about some gray-haired, old-looking man sitting on a throne with a baseball bat and waiting to just knock you smooth out? What is it that you think of when you think about God? C.S. Lewis would say it like this. The most important thing in your life is what you view or what you think about when you think about God. Can I ask you this morning? If you were asked by a friend to describe God, what would you say? How would you describe How would you depict? What would you craft? What words would you use? What what pictures would you paint? Isaiah saw the Lord. He said, he's holy, 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 thrice holy, completely holy. In other words, he's saying he's different. He's different. He's different than me. Like he is flawless. He is perfect. He is pure. There is nothing flawed about him. There is not a speck that is out of place. He is holy. He is right. He is good. And here's what he says. The whole earth is full of his glory. You want to know about God? Look around. The whole earth is just full of his glory. Paul would write in the book of Romans and he would say that creation, it cries out that there is a God. And if you just look around, if you just look up, if you just for a moment, 
breathe in his creation, you would realize there is a creator. He is creator God and ruling God and sovereign God and good God and, and controlled God. He is a God that is holy, holy, holy. At the, at the sound of their voice, the, the temple began to shake. And now Isaiah has this vision of God. Can I ask you a question? Have you ever encountered God? The God who made you, the God who created you, the God who loves you. The Bible says in the beginning, God created. The psalmist will say, I praise you, God, because I am fearfully and wonderfully made. You are made by God, but yet you are loved by God. John 3, 16, y'all know this one well, right? For God so what? Somebody so loved. Who? He loved the world. Look at somebody right now and say, that means you. Go, please tell him right now. That means you, that, 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 that God didn't just make you and kick you out here into earth and say, have a good time. No, but he, he made you and he, and he loves you, but also that God wants you. This is where I'm like, what? Like God wants me? Yeah, uh, Peter would write words like this. God is not slow as some people consider slowness, but he is patient with us. Listen, not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. I stand here today and I tell you these powerful truths about God because I want you to get a glimpse of the God who made you, the God who loves you, the God who wants you. Not just some future version of you. He wants you. Look up. Get a vision of who God is. That's the only way we will be ready to be braced for impact. See, real impact happens when we are impacted by who God truly is. Real change happens when you and I pause and realize who God is, but we don't just look up, but when we look up, it causes us to do something next. Here's the second point. Write it down. Look at your neighbor and say, write it down. Go, go and tell it. Write this down. Number one, we want to look up and see who God is, which causes us in turn to look in and see who we are. Look in and <laughs> see who you are. See, it's only when we get a glimpse of God <laughs> that we are forced to get a glimpse of the man or, or, or woman in the mirror. Who are you? Really, look, look at what Isaiah says. He says, and I said, in light of seeing God, here's what he said. And I said, say it with me, somebody in the church, loud and proud. He said, what? Whoa, is me. He's like, uh-oh. Isn't it awesome when Isaiah got a right view of God, he didn't puff his chest out and go, yeah, boy. Like there was no pride. There was no arrogance. There was no confidence. There was absolute destroyed humility on the ground. Woe is me. I'm lost. I'm a man of unclean lips. And I, I love Isaiah because then he throws everybody under the bus. I love it. He's like, dude, I am messed up. I am jacked up. I am toe up from the flow. Y'all know what I'm saying, right? He's like, man, I am undone. My life is a wreck. Uh, my heart is wicked, just as the young lady read earlier. My heart is deceitful of all things and, and, and desperately wicked. And then he says, so, so are you and you and you and you and you. Look at what he says. It's awesome, right? And I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. If he was from East Texas, he would have said, and all y'all are too. Oh, y'all. And this is what we see. Man, if we want to brace for impact, we've got to get a vision of who God is, his greatness, his glory, his goodness, his might, his power. That he made us, created us, loves us, and wants us. But in that reality of how great God is, it takes us to a place where we realize how broken we are. As a matter of fact, we realize three things, man. You are broken. Look at your neighbor and say, ooh, he's talking about you right now. Tell, tell him right now, all right? Uh, yeah, here it is, all right? Like, like you're broken. Romans 3.10 says, none is righteous. 
Look at someone else and say, yep, you ain't right. Go, go ahead, tell them. You've been wanting to tell them that all morning, right? You ain't right. Like the Bible says, none of us are righteous, not even one. But why are we not right? Because we are sinful. All of us have sinned and fallen short of God's glory, God's standard. God is perfect. God is holy. God is mighty. God is pure. God is glorious. God is great. And here's what Paul says, and we ain't. We're not. We are broken, sinful, and dead by sin. One, uh, by one man's sin entered the world, and therefore the Bible says, death by sin. Be, and death is now passed on to all people. Why? Because all sin. Nobody dodges this bullet. Your death day is coming. Sin is in the world and sin is in you. And now we're in an interesting position. Because you're like, bro, I thought you were going to help me brace for impact. Now you're like saying I'm dead and I'm sinful and I'm broken. Like what is, what? Hey man, what is going on? Well, that's because when we look up, we see God, which forces us to look in and see ourself and our need and our brokenness and our helplessness, which causes us thirdly, write this down. Don't miss it. It causes us to look to, look to Look up, see God, look in, see yourself, and then look too, because here's what you need to understand. While the world would tell you this, save yourself, I wanna let you know you cannot save yourself. But a savior has come. You cannot rescue yourself, but a rescue has come. And some of you are sitting right here in this room and you're like, yay for those students, man, meeting Jesus, crossing that line of faith. This is awesome. Can I just tell you, Jesus didn't just come to save teenagers. He came to save some dads today. He, he came to save some moms today. He came to save some grandparents and great-grandparents today, some children today. Why? Why? Because there's no one outside of his love. There's no one outside of the desire for him to save. There's no one who's gone too far, messed up too much, that he cannot save. And so Isaiah, in this moment of saying, man, I am jacked up, toe up, messed up from the flow up, and so are all of you, here's what happens. All of a sudden, he looks up, and one of the seraphim flew to him. He had in his hand a burning coal that had taken with the tongs from the altar. Now, again, if I'm him, I'm freaking out and running for my life. I'm just saying, like, like, like this dude's coming over with, the, with, the, with a fiery coal from the fire. Um, and I don't have time to talk about this too much, but that's a, that, that's a scary moment and a, and a big deal. And he said, and he took it and, 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 and he touched his mouth. And he said, behold, this has touched your lips. Your guilt is taken away. Your sin is what, somebody? Atoned for. Now, in the Old Testament, the word atoned is used a lot. In the New Testament, it's never used. What does the word at atone mean? Well, the word atonement means to, at, to make one at one with. It means to, to make enemies at one together, to bring peace, to bring unity. And this is an um, amazing truth that in the Old Testament, it speaks of the atonement. And the New Testament never does because Jesus comes and he fulfills the atonement and he paints the whole picture of what happened on the cross and what happens when he died in our place and what happened when he took our sin. Look, in the New Testament, and it talks about propitiation, which is a big word that simply means wrath absorber. On the cross, what happened? Jesus had atonement for us. Yes. What does that mean? It means he absorbed all the wrath that was due you on himself. It is reconciliation. On the cross, he brought us from sinners, separated from God, and made a way back to God purification. He was pure and holy. The Bible says that he who was sinless took on all our sin so that you and I might become the righteousness of God. Redemption. He bought us back. We owed a price, a debt we could never pay for our sins. Jesus paid it all. Anybody with me so far? On the cross, there was justification, which means we were made right with God as righteous, holy, good, true, mighty, pure, good judge had every right to cast us, separate us from him forever. But in Jesus, we are justified. We are made right. And all of this is summed up in a word, sozo, salvation, which means he came to rescue us completely, totally, forever. 
Now, all of that reminds me that while we were still weak, at the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. Look at somebody and say, that's you. Go tell them, all right? Please tell them. Uh, for the right time, because we often think ungodly. You're like, boy, y'all better listen. No, that's you. That's me. At the right time, he died for the ungodly. And God shows his love for us. Look at somebody and say, that's us. Tell them right now. That's us. He shows his love for us in that while we were still sinners, what happened? Christ, what? Died. For who? See, when you look up and you see God in his might, his beauty, his power, his holiness, his perfection, you realize that though you might be better than the person sitting next to you, when you compare yourself to God, you are way off, undone, unclean, in need of a savior, which causes you to look to Jesus the perfect, spotless lamb of God who came to seek and save the lost. And the only way that you and I will truly be braced for the impact of this world and death that will knock at our door, every single one of us at some point, the only way to get ready for death is to get ready in life. See, the Bible says that the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is what, somebody? Eternal life. Where? In Christ Jesus, our Lord. So can I ask you, have you looked up and realized there's a God who made you and loves you and wants you? Has that caused you to look in and realize you're a sinner separated from God, dead and in need of a savior, which then calls you to look to Jesus who came died, rose again to give me and you life. And has that led you to the place where you confessed Jesus as Lord? Where you've come to the place, dad, where you're like, I can't do this. Jesus, I need you to be God and Lord and King and Savior of my life. And the best I know how, I give all that I know of me to all that I know of you. Would you be my king? Would you be my savior? Would you be my Lord? Live in me, change me now and forever. Have you been there, mom? Listen, I'm not asking today if you go to church, you're a good guy or a good, good girl, or if you're a good businessman or, 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 or a good mom or, or a good teacher or, or a good doctor or more moral than your, than your neighbor. I'm not asking you any of that. I'm asking, have you come to the place of surrender? And you come to the place and you say, I am yours. You see, eternal impact is only realized when we look at Jesus by faith as Lord and Savior. And this morning, I believe that's where some of you are right here. Because today is your day. It's the day that you see God and see yourself, but you see Jesus in a fresh new way. And this morning you're like, I need Jesus. When that kind of impact happens, it causes you lastly, write this down, to look out. To look out. What happened when Isaiah saw the Lord, saw himself, saw the atonement, the forgiveness, and was granted the absolute being made right with God? How, how, what, what happened next? Look, then I heard a voice from the Lord saying, whom shall I send and who will go for us? Then I said, I, I get a picture of the, 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 the little kindergartner in class. Who's got an answer? And he's going, oh, oh. Y'all know what I'm talking about, right? Now, I don't know if that's what Isaiah was doing, but I feel that's what he was doing. Because he had seen God, he had seen himself, and now he has experienced forgiveness and cleansing and healing. He's made right with God. And in that moment, God has the audacity to ask a question. So who's gonna go for us? And Isaiah's like, sign me up. I'll go, send me. Which reminds me of things like Jesus said. He said this, followers are fishers. 
Jesus would say, come follow me and I'll send you out to fish for people that saved people. They are sent people that, that rescued people live to rescue people that, that, that found people. They want to find people and that those impacted by Jesus desire nothing more in life than to make an impact for Jesus. See, we can call this impact weekend, but can we just pause for a second? If out of this weekend, nobody's impacted, was it really impact weekend? But if, if, if by chance this morning, by the grace of God, we would look up, we would see how good and great God is which would drive us to look in and realize how desperate in need we are. And out of that, mom, out out of that, granddad, that we would say, I need Jesus. I want Jesus. Jesus, I'm yours. If, If that's where we get out of this, impact will have been made in here but don't miss it. Impact will begin to be made out there. If it stays in the house, then it's not impact. But if it rolls out of these doors into our homes, into our schools, into our families, into our school, into our churches, into our communities, into our jobs, into our cubicles, into if it rolls there, let's go. But that only happens when we've experienced impact, when those impacted by Jesus make an impact for Jesus, how does that happen? Here's how it happens. You just gotta put your yes on the table. You just gotta put your yes on the table. And I promise you, put your yes on the table and you'll have no idea what God is about to do. Several years ago, we were praying about adoption, thinking about adoption. We were open to adoption. We even went to a a couple of agencies preview nights. After leaving some of those, we're like, ah, it just feels weird. I don't know. Maybe we'll just support adoption. Maybe we'll give to those who feel called to adoption. But in our heart of hearts, we knew that's, ah. And so one night, Heather and I, the best way I know to tell you, we just put our yes on the table. We said, God, we don't know how it's gonna happen. We don't know the steps we're gonna take, but all we're saying is yes. We're open. In about uh, two years time, this little boy gets brought into our life. I'm like, I can't believe this. We didn't chase it down. We didn't seek it. We didn't go into an agency. It was an absolute miracle and hand and work of God. (laughs) 18 months later, after being in our house, this little boy became our son. Now, I don't know what God is gonna do through this little boy, but I know right now he's doing something to us through this little boy. He is now almost six years old, growing as big as a truck, as wild as can be. We have two daughters, and now we got a little boy just wrecking shop. (laughs) How did that happen? Just because we put our yes on the table. When I was 18 years old, I was sitting in church, and I realized for the very first time I knew a lot about Jesus, but I did not know Jesus. And that night, I realized Jesus I don't need another song, another sermon, another communion. I need a savior. And that night, the best I know how, I just put my yes on the table. Jesus, I'm yours. And maybe that's exactly where you are today. Would you just bow your heads right where you are this morning? And I want to ask you, dad, mom, grandparent, teenager, child in the room, Do you need to put your yes on the table with Jesus this morning? If you're in this place and you would say, Ryan, this morning, here's what I realize. There's a God who made me. 
There is sin that has separated me. There's Jesus that can save me. And today I'm ready to trust him as my king. Ryan, would you pray for me, man? I need Jesus. I'm not gonna come to you. I'm not gonna call you out. I'm not gonna drag you out. I just wanna pray for you this morning. And like dozens of dozens of teenagers this weekend, you realize, man, I need Jesus. I want Jesus. Ryan, would you pray for me this morning? I need Jesus to be my king. If that's you and no one else looking around, would you just slip your hand up right where you are so I can pray for you? Just slip it up. Awesome. Thank you. Lift it up high so I can see you. Thank you so much. All over this place, hey, that's me. Ryan, pray for me. Thank you. Thank you for being honest this morning. What a beautiful just acknowledgement. I see you way over there. Thank you. Hey, God, right now, I just want to pause and say thank you for every man and woman in this room that just lifted their hand and said, Ryan, pray for me. I need Jesus. And God, I thank you that more than seeing their hand, right now you see their heart. And God, today can and will be the day of their salvation, and they will never be the same. And today will be the day they brace for impact. And today they're going to encounter you. They're never going to be the same. So Lord, thank you for everyone in this room who just said, Ryan, pray for me. Now I want to ask a next question. Some of you need to put your yes on the table. Jesus is your King. He is your Lord. He is your God. But you need to put your yes on the table for something different. Maybe it's baptism. Maybe it's church membership. Maybe it's a call in your life. Hey, I don't know. I didn't plan this, but maybe it's adoption. You say, Ryan, pray for me. There's something I need to put my yes on the table for this morning. Would you slip your hand up right now? Ryan, there's something I need to put my yes on the table for. Would you just slip your hand up? Thanks. Awesome. I love it. And that's just the next step for you today. And it's going to be an impacting, life-altering change. So God, thank you for the acknowledgement of those in this room who would say, I need to put my yes on the table for something completely different. So Lord, would you take that heart and that life and do your work in Jesus' name.